of winter in Vermont and making your way through that brief little snow squall that we had. Anyway, we're delighted this morning to have a double header <laughs> with <coughs> Nadia Fernandez and <coughs> Lisa Komorowski. I'm going to introduce <coughs> Lisa first because uh, she came to UMass almost two years ago uh, <clears throat> to head up their uh, <clears throat> program in conservation genetics. Uh, conservation, wait a minute, what's the exact title? Uh, uh, conservation genomics or molecular ecology. Right, yeah. right, exactly. And she's accumulated quite a wonderful team of, of students and postdoctoral fellows, et cetera in that program already. So we're going to hear a lot from you in the future about a lot of different uh, topics. And one of her newest students, <coughs> uh, <coughs> Nadia Fernandez, I should mention first, uh, <coughs> Lisa says that she comes from, originally from Buffalo, New York, so snow is <laughs> no So we can drive here no problem. <laughs> Uh, but she wandered out to the West Coast for her education, uh, <coughs> uh, San Diego State University, mm -hmm. and then the University of California, Davis, and a postdoctoral uh, assignment in that area as well, which uh, she'll be telling us more about her work in that regard. We're glad you're back east, Lisa. <laughs> Welcome to New England. And <coughs> Nadia Fernandez, uh, grew up in Indiana and stayed there for the first part of her uh, education, including a master's from Purdue. Prestigious. Congratulations. <laughs> and she was enticed to come to Amherst for her PhD work. Without further ado, I believe that uh, Nadia is going to be All right. Can everyone hear me okay? Totally fine? Okay, great. Um, and I'm assuming you guys will ask questions as I'm going throughout. That's totally fine. You're welcome to stop me. Um, so the title of my talk is Conservation Genomics and Raptors. And I'm going to be talking about more specifically just a few species. I'm going to talk first about what my concentration was in Purdue, which was looking at golden eagles. That was what I've known from my, my beginning of my career. You know, I, I did some undergrad research. I was a research tech. And then I was a master's student at Purdue, and a lot of it was involved using looking at um, genetics and golden eagles. And so uh, I'm going to talk to you the first part of that, and then I'm going to switch into talking about like falcons, some of the falcons you may see around here, and looking at the genomics in that. So hopefully you guys will find something satisfying after this talk <laughs> about raptors. Um, so first, I know these pictures are a little dark uh, about me. Like I said, I got my master's at Purdue. Um, here is this very dark picture. I don't know if you can see it. I'm holding a golden eagle chiclet. And the, a, lot of, a lot of the work that we concentrated on um, was out of California. We had a lot of the population in North America of golden eagles is in California. They do occupy um, a large portion of North America, but the populations we were mostly interested and worked on was in California. So you can see that it's, it's kind of hard to see, but these like mountainous ranges and these ranges where you have a lot of sparse vegetation and a lot of open habitat, because golden eagles love to sit on perches and hunt ground squirrels. That's their favorite thing. Um, so it's, it was really great, the field work and being out in California and being, our, being on like private lands and having the opportunity to study them and see you know, their behaviors in, in action instead of sitting at the lab. So I'm gonna talk about a few different methods and I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty, but the first one being talking about non-invasive genetics. Has anyone heard of non-invasive genetics before? I'm sure genetics, but in terms of non-invasive, no. Okay, so non-invasive, that's, that's talking about not actually like handling the animal, right? So we can think about that of like, what, what might they have left over for us that we can use for like analyzing their DNA. So in this case, um, we use feathers, and I'll talk about a few other ones, but more specifically a definition is using forensic style DNA samples, um, hair, scat, feathers, collected without ever seeing the animal. 
And we are interested in this in terms of like conservation because it's hard to um, sample rare species and it's and especially if they're endangered if they have a any sort of conservation implication and and also species that might be sensitive to humans are also difficult right so this is a, a great tool for us to utilize to to understand um, biologically what might be happening with some of the wildlife species and so some of the methods like i mentioned you could think about is you can think about feces they, they extract uh, dna out of feces uh, hair snares from bears, I think that's a, this is a photo up top of a hair snare. Um, urine, saliva uh, that might be left over on a carcass. eDNA is what's called environmental DNA, so you can, for example, um, look at that like in freshwater streams or water, you can take water and you can extract DNA out of it and figure out what kind of occupants are in that water system. It's a pretty cool application. But more specifically, what we were doing um, was feathers, and we use uh, naturally shed feathers, but you can also, people also look at eggs as well. So um, the way we did it, it's super, this schematic is kind of simple, but because I don't want to get into nitty gritty, is that we first took a feather sample, we would extract the DNA, and essentially what we're putting on it is a genetic tag, and you can think of that as like a fingerprint, right? You hear like everyone has different fingerprints, that's why in forensics they have your fingerprint, they'll, they'll figure out who the bad guy is. Um, so that's kind of the application that we use, is that we, we find, you know, whatever, a feather, and then we extract the DNA, and then we essentially treat it as a fingerprint, because everyone has unique qualities and characteristics about their DNA. And this Thinking about it as a fingerprint, that'll, that'll give us the confidence of saying, you know, this, it's not going to change in appearance or fall off over time. You essentially have this data with us, and there's no need to capture the animal initially. You don't, you don't need to capture them. It could be from the feathers itself. And, you know, before I jump into the, um, the differences between, because I'm going to be talking about genetics in this first portion of my talk, and then I'm going to talk about genomics, and I want to, you know, quickly establish, I think if you're here for Sarah's talk, maybe she's went over this before, but I will talk about genomics later in the lecture, but I want to just establish that when I talk about genetics with the Golden Eagles, that's talking about looking at a few or a select um, number of genes, whereas with geno genomics, it's talking about your entire DNA sequence. So looking at all the genes, the functions and interactions. So like genetics, the smaller portion, genomics is the much wider portion. So for Golden Eagles, we're gonna be talking about genetics. We're looking at a subset of genes within um, the species. Okay, so before I get into the study, I wanna talk about some life history traits about the Golden Eagle. So they sexually mature around 30 years of age. Uh, they typically have a clutch size between one and two chicks. Three is pretty rare. Um, and they are sexually mature at about five years. And they have this whole Arctic distribution, which means they occupy the nor northern hemisphere. So they, like I said, they're in North America, but they also are in Eurasia and parts of northern Africa up here. And I described earlier a little bit, but here's some photos, more photos. This is in California. This It's a little difficult to see, but these really kind of sparse vegetative habitats that they that they really love and they really love there's a you can probably see this little tree here it's not a little tree it's a big tree actually but it's a perfect kind of tree where there's not a lot of vegetation on it the eagle can perch up there see everything it wants to and it's great for hunting and also in this case this tree is high enough that it's great for nesting as well and the golden eagle has these really large movements. I think we think of eagles, they can fly these really large distances. So this is a, a, a great map that looked at um, over decades of telemetry work in golden eagles where they strap the backpacks on and are able to get movement data out of the eagles. And it's very informative, not only for biological reasons, but we can use genetics and information like that to tie in to help figure out the story of what's happening with golden eagles. So we can see that we have this eastern population um, that tends to go up into northern Canada, and then we also have this western population where they have golden eagles um, wintering in, uh, or from Alaska, making these movements into the western United States as well. So a lot of movements, 
between golden eagles and making these really far um, movements as well. So what we, to do that, we collected a few different methods. I talked about feathers. So that was one thing we did is that, um, it's hard to see here, but this, this is a very large tree and this little thing is um, one of my field, one of the field biologists who's working with me. We were able to find these, um, I find we have located feathers or nests and we, first we look for naturally shed feathers around the nest site and then we will look around like other trees that the males might perch on because what will happen at these nest sites is it's typically the female that will reside on the actual nest the male doesn't come in that often but then the male will perch up in a tree a little bit further away but like high enough that it can see into the nest so the idea of us not only looking underneath the tree but trying to spread and look as far around as we can is that we're able to grab essentially mom's fingerprint, dad's fingerprint, and then also um, the very much help. I think you can see it. The, this is uh, the field biologist named Joe Papp. He will climb the trees, a, you know, a trained climber and a trained um, handler of golden eagles and we'll get the chicks and essentially we just get really quick some measurements and some blood data, but that doesn't, it's very case by case basis in terms of if we are confident we can handle the chips, chicks without disturbing. So we're collecting types of two different types in this case, is feathers and um, blood from chicks. And I already talked about this a little bit, if you want a little bit more schematic, is like we have these um, feathers and then they essentially they get, they made without the effort of magic, they get put into DNA into these tubes. And this really what we have is like this, this idea of markers throughout our genome. So like these areas that we mark and we can essentially look at how variation is occurring in certain places. And then we can, that provides us with like statistical confidence essentially that this particular feather or individual is unique. And so we can, you know, essentially put on that fingerprint or that genetic tag. And then in magic, it always happens that it's, it looks much easier on this picture that it's just, oh, you just use computers, but it's a lot of work in terms of the processes that happen after of trying to sort out the data. So I'll get to the more interesting stuff now of what we did and what we found. So um, I was involved in this project. I was, uh, you know, this, my, my mentor led this paper and it, this paper was looking at the first genetic structure of golden eagles in the United States. Like before there had been studies looking at more concentrated areas, you know, like California or like um, some of the western states but this one was actually it was the effort of a lot of collaborators really that were able to harness all these samples together so we can start to look at the genetic structure that's occurring throughout the states and essentially we were looking to um, see if we always try to test against a null hypothesis right like what are we testing against and and we're testing to to see if if the, the population is panmythic and what that means is like, are they interacting as like one population? Is gene flow always occurring between every individual equally, essentially? And I hope it's not too difficult to see, but um, we, we run some, some tests, which is called structure. And essentially it's looking at the way the genetics uh, data will cluster and then from that we can infer populations. Um, but in this specific case, what I'm showing you right here is that if we look at the individuals we sampled, like there's a handful of in Alaska, but here is like the Western United States. If you look at, if we analyze this group together, we will get this plot. And that's from our genetic data. And the way you can, you can look at this plot is like, if you see there's all these individual bars, each bar is an, an, well, each bar represents one single individual, so one eagle. So when these bars are differentiated with different colors, that indicates that this is clustering genetic, like, genetically different, like your genetic data, or your, yeah, your genetic data is um, differentiating compared to the other groups. So in this case, it's hard to see. This one group is Alaska. So you can see it has this, all this dark blue and it's not representative really of the other, what is seen here as California and the other Western states. So from this plot itself, we can look at it and see like, okay, we see essentially three different 
clusters. Alaska, and this is light blue with California, and then everything else is the western United States, but some individuals are having more green than the other, you know, California and Alaska. So we can read this as um, that the, the golden eagles within this, within this uh, grouping that we analyzed, that they are um, clustering into three genetically distinct populations. Essentially that Alaska is acting as a single population, California is acting as a single population, and then the Western United States is acting almost as a single population. But I don't want to confuse that with like there's no gene flow happening. There is, that means like there's no mating that's not happening. There is some shared genetic, you know, they're sharing some color, so there is some sharing between there. But the main takeaway is that these, whatever is the most representative of the colors represents how distinct they might be. That, are those genetic differences, are they actually different species or close to being different species? Um, no, I think we, we really um, cautious when we talk about like species because there has to be like a lot of lines of evidence. I think that just means that there is not as much gene flow occurring between these two regions. So like in that case, you know, Alaska and California, two totally different colors. So there's not, there's not that much um, mating that might be happening between both of these. So yeah, so still same, same species, but these, these, essentially the main message out of the golden eagles is like we, we realize that they move these really large distances and we think, oh, there's no way they would isolate themselves. You know, you just think about that of like, why wouldn't they? They can move such long distances, but the, the um, what they do do is they're, they're uh, partially migrant or partially, you know, resident, which means some of their population will reside and another part of their population will migrate to other places. So that can influence where they're mating, where they're moving to, to find a new territory to mate. So there's a lot of different behavioral things that are happening. Does that help? Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so that was just one analysis. You can really group this into two, a couple of different ways. Um, so we also looked at, uh, in this case, we're looking, okay, so we saw from this graph, California is acting different, right? The California population is looking different compared to Alaska and the eastern states, or the western states. So we said, okay, well, what if we remove the California population and look at the, the genetic structure um, with the remaining you know, localities. So we analyzed Alaska, the Western states, and the Eastern population. And we saw that um, you know, Alaska still looked you know, kind of different, at least in terms of like the Western states, but more importantly that we saw that the Eastern states, you know, what's occupying this range right over here and where you guys are, <laughs> um, is that they're really quite Quite different, like they're um, you know exhibiting this like light blue color in in um, more so than the other two groups. So again, this is showing that they are clustering into three genetically distinct populations. That this is Alaska's clustering together. The individuals are clustering together. The Western individuals are also clustering together. So there's not as much gene flow, but also with the Eastern United States that they're, more importantly, is also clustering together, so there might not be as much exchange of genes as we would potentially think of. Quick question. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that the eastern population is much smaller than the western population. Is that yes. a contributor to the genetic makeup? Yes, uh, yes, it can for sure. And another, um, a lot of the population is in the western United States, so that's definitely true that there is much less occupants in the eastern United States. Um, and they do move into, you know, I think you're probably wondering why we don't, why do we have any samples from Canada? The, the answer is obtaining international permits is quite hard, so we can't easily obtain, especially they're protected under the um, Bald Eagle and Golden Eagle Act, so it's hard you know, you have a couple layers to cross, but international permits kind of um, came into play where we couldn't obtain samples. But the, 
the eastern population is, has historically been known to move into Canada, and that's where they had a lot of their breeding grounds. Um, but yeah, but they are a smaller population, and that could be playing into effect, um, that the differences we see. So, you know, like I, I just previously said, we have these, um, you think about golden eagles and their large, their large movements, and you kind of wonder, like, what's, why are we seeing these genetic differences? Like, why aren't they interacting as much? And, and one thing that can be thought of, not just in eagles, but in terrestrial systems itself, is that geographic barriers could be the, the reason why you might see these, these differences that, you know, potentially like the Appalachian Mountains or desert systems or anything that might almost filter the gene flow. So it might filter the individuals that might be moving. Um, and I think that's usually you can think of like ground animals. That's like, okay, that, that might make sense. But I think it's important to realize that this can also happen with species that can, you know, fly over things very easily and, and um, make these large movements that they are still susceptible to being isolated by geographic features. Okay, so, you know, I talked about, you know, the genetics and stuff, but what does that mean in terms of conservation? And what we can think about is that it's, um, you know, the golden eagle, why should this matter, is that it's, they're an important part of the ecosystem, and that when we have genetics to help identify golden eagles, we can think of this as, as a mechanism to, to utilize in the future. It's like if you've had a wounded individual that came into a rehabilitation center, we can now, you know, get the genetic data from the individual and potentially assign it to a population of like, oh, this individual exhibits the same profile that was in California and it's in the East Coast right now. So maybe this individual was originally from California. You know, we can start to create essentially these profiles of um, the different regions. We can also think of that um, not just wounded individuals, but migratory individuals. There are people who, who study eagles and who track golden eagles. Um, for research, and so if you trap a golden eagle, you can also obtain genetic data and if, figure out if they're migratory, and also this will help inform the fly pathways that they use um, throughout the United States to make their large movements. But also, genetics isn't, it's, it's, can be helped in other fashions that you might not think about. It can be used to help manage genetic diversity, because you know management is always looking for genetic diversity that usually reflects a more healthy population if you have a lot of diversity within your genetics. So they can strive for that and then you can look at gene flow, which is what I was just talking about, you know, the, the exchange of genes, but also you can look at inbreeding that might be happening um, in golden eagles and potentially you can look at relatedness of individuals. You know, we had that, the nest sites that I was talking about, the feathers and the chicks, you could look at relatedness and, you know, turnover, like how our are the chicks staying around, or you know, how is the are the parents still always using the same nest? Kind of questions like that you can ask. Okay, and so with that, I wanted to talk about first part about genetics, but then I thought I would talk about something that you guys might see around here, which is the peregrine falcon, and talk about more genomics, like where has this advanced? So. Genetics is great in terms of for non-invasive because it enables us to use hair snares, feathers, and these like bits of pieces of DNA, but those might be kind of lower quality. But this could, if you can utilize genomics, you know, I talked about it's an entire um, set of genes that you have. We can answer some different questions, and that's what I wanted to jump into was talking about genomics and also talking about falcons and specifically you guys have peregrine falcons around here, so I thought I'd insert something that you guys might see or hear about. Um, so this, I'm gonna be describing a study that happened, uh, that was published in 2013. So this was a study in 2013, so six years ago, and, and I, if it's a, it's six years ago probably doesn't sound like that much, but in terms of the advancements of genetics to wildlife biology, it was, this paper I remember being like a really, a really, um, it was really impressive and I was like, whoa, I didn't know we could do these things. And it's crazy to think where we can come out now because now more so everyone's applying the genomics, you know, analyzing the whole genome. But this paper was like pivotal in understanding falcons and their biology. 
Um, so they looked at two different species they were focused on, was the peregrine falcon and the sacred falcon. And it's hard to see a little bit. So they utilized the, so the peregrine and sacred falcon is in this topology, but they compared that to three different species, being that the chicken, three different avian species, species the chicken, the turkey, and the zebra finch. And you know, you're probably wondering why these why these specific avian species. These are one of the most well-studied avian species we have the most information of. So if we can do compare, compare their genomes to, other, to those species, we can have you know, probably more infor information on the functions of the genes and how they're interacting. And you're probably wondering why is there a lizard? This is a null. <laughs> why it's on this side. When we generate these topologies or we look at these relationships between species, we have to ground essentially what's called like grounding the topology. So we have to have an out group. Um, and that's what this annul <laughs> plays in, into this. But I'm not gonna get into the, the nitty gritty of what they um, looked at like in terms of, cause it, it can really get pretty complicated. But when you look at the comparative genomics, you can look at, these are the five different, this is a Venn diagram of the five different avian species. You can look at the, you know, how many genes are private to the species, but also you can look at shared genes between species, and this can be informative of understanding um, the history of the species and how long has it been a species, and look at the historical context. So um, I'm going to talk about a couple of biological results that they found when they were looking at the whole genomes of the saker and the peregrine falcon. So the, one of the things they found was the beak formation. Um, uh, the beak formation genes were a little bit different in, the different in each species. So the falcon genes are known to be longer, wider, and deeper. So they're really robust. You know, they're car carnivorous, so they really have to have beaks to kind of tear the, tear the um, you know, part. And so they compare this against the, everything's against the chicken and the zebra finch. Um, and they were analyzing genes that were specific to the development of avian beaks. And we know that from analyzing what I was talking about previously of the well-studied chicken and the zebra finch that we were able, you know, after years and years of studying, we now know there are certain genes that lead to the formation of their beaks. And so by developing all this information up until this study, they were able to look at these specific genes of the beak formation, and they were able to find that there was alterations um, within the uh, beak formations compared to the chicken and the zebra finch. I mean, if you think about it, the chicken and the zebra finch both have different beak formations because they're, they're functioning differently in terms of their diet. Because so falcons are supposed to have these, this hook to their beaks. So this, you know, kind of confirms that they're, they're having genes that um, the changes in their genes compared to the, the chicken and the finch are leading to that formation of that hook. And it's, it's great to, you know, be able to get to this point, you know, it's kind of like, well, we can see that there's physical differences, but, but when you can utilize genomics and look at there's certain variations within a gene that can lead to this, it can be very informative of understanding the development that happened um, to essentially falcon beaks to what they are today. Another thing that they had found was they looked at um, some heat stress genes within the genomes. So uh, the Peregrine and Saker falcons um, are known to occupy different habitats. So the Saker falcons, they don't occupy, they don't occupy in the North America, but they're in more of the um, Eurasia, and they also, it's more like arid, temperate environments, so they're used to, to areas where there's little to no water. And I think that's informative to what they found compared to the par paragons when they're not in those, they don't occupy those environments. But they had found that um, they analyzed a couple of different genes. They analyzed genes that, that were known to uh, be functional in the kidneys. They looked at genes that had to do with homeostasis and water conservation, so basically how the body regulates fluids. They were looking at those specific genes, and they had found that the, that the genes that they analyzed, that the saker falcons had differences compared to the peregrine falcons. 
in terms of like, you know, different mutations or copies with, of that gene. So, you know, what does that mean? That means that perhaps the Saker Falcons then are um, more able to utilize, you know, utilize whatever water regulation they can to, you know, live in these, these arid environments where there is little to no water. And so they also, you know, they, they looked at that, but then they also looked at genes promoting thermal regula regulatory cooling by sweat production and essentially looking at urine um, from the kidneys, the flow of urine to the kidneys, looking at those specific genes because it all has to do with how you're, you're utilizing the water in your body, you know, in areas where you're not gonna have access to water. And again, they were finding these differences with the Saker falcons, which is informative because, you know, to understand how they, they utilize um, these features will help us know if, if they can keep this up in the future and especially looking like in the past and how these features might have been and how they're looking into the future because that can ultimately play into conservation and understanding um, the physio physiology of these birds. But, you know, what I said from the previous slide and this slide of talking about um, the regulation of fluids within their body, they overall, the authors suggest that this might be a genetic basis that which the snake, the sacred falcons cope with um, the desert and the arid temperatures, or temperature, arid habitats. Um, so I think it's, it's uh, to me, like at that time and still now when I was reading this paper, I thought it was really cool that you can look at the whole genome and you can be like, there's this really cool functionality that's happening within the genes that can lead you to be able to live in these type of environments um, between different falcon species. <coughs> so, that being said, you know, there's this interest in studying falcons because, you know, they're, they're widely distributed throughout the globe um, and their conservation status can differ based on where their, their range is or based on where they are geographically located. Um, but for the sake of this talk, too, that the establishing that the sacred falcons um, are globally classified as vulnerable. So that's why, you know, understanding their biology and understanding the genomics and their physiology will help us inform us to um, understand how they might be managed or conserved. So, um, so with that being said, uh, you know, they, this was in 2013 where they, six years ago essentially, where they were looking um, to understand it, but then it's, you, need, you need to, I guess, understand that this is a, uh, we didn't, but advancements that we've had since then have been like really great that we now had a recent study just last year which essentially made this um, new genomes from the Saker uh, and Peregrine Falcons but using chromosome level and what that means essentially that's kind of like the, 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 the aim we all aim for when we're talking about genomics is be able to put all this genetic information into different chromosomes and I'm, I'm assuming Talk, like you can think about the little chromosomes, the arms that I'm talking about, because when we, we generate these genomes, not everything is to a level we can understand how they're, you know, functioning. Like we have an idea, but we're not confident in how they're um, interacting or, um, you know, making these different copies. So when we get to this sort of level, it's, it's really impressive if we can get to a, a level where it's like we have this high confidence in understanding the functions of the bird and the species, it's, it's really promising. So that's my tidbit of this, is, this has been moving forward, uh, the studies of the falcons with the genomes. There's a group that just came out of the chromosome level, so now it'll be great to understand, you know, these genes that they identified in 2013, what does this mean now when we have like much more information about the genome? Like, are we gonna see even more differences between these falcon species or not? So, with that being said, with everything I just said about golden eagles and falcons, what can you take away from this? What you take away from this is that genetics and genomics can help inform wildlife species. You can look at gene flow. You can look at the functions that are happening within your genes. You can also look at inbreeding and relatedness. But, you know, as I said, as technology advances, that gives really great promise to understanding the biological, morphological, and the physiological functions 
um, within a species, which is important for conservation. With that being said, there's an Eli, yes. any questions? <laughs> Um, he is very brave. I always watch, I don't ever, like, you have to have very specific training for that. Um, golden eagles are, they're pretty timid, like they won't, they won't stay around, the, they'll stay kind of close by, but they're not, um, they're not like attacking when you're up in the nest, but that doesn't mean we aren't trying our hardest to be as efficient and as fast as we can to essentially cause as less stress to the bird. It really is like case by case basis on how we analyze if we do or do not go up into the nest because if, if for some reason the chick might be a little too old that we think they might, you know, fledge or jump, we won't do it. So there's, there's really a lot of precautions every case we go to a nest site. But um, there are some different species where they're much more protective, like owls are usually more protective where you have, they're really, I think they have like a, my colleague wears, um, what's it called, the hockey mask, essentially, because they really are like, stri they can be striking on the head and really trying to defend the nest, but the golden eagles are a little bit more timid. Yeah, but it's, it's dangerous and it's, it's something that we take very responsibly. Yes? With your, um, you were saying the golden eagle matures at 30. At 30 years? Is it, it can live up to 30 years and it's sexually mature at five years. Oh, five, okay, five yeah. years. Now the two to three chicks, is that like per year or is that? Um, it's one to two, three is pretty rare. Uh, they won't, they won't um, have offspring every year. It, it really kind of varies and sometimes it, the, you know, there are times when it's like consecutive years, but what can really control that also is the amount of prey items available. And, and one of the seasons we were out there, so there's one season I went out there and I think that was when California was going through that drought. So we really weren't seeing a lot of, you know, new nestlings within the nests. But then the next season we were out there, it was like heavily, there was rain a lot before we, we even got there. And I was totally clear in the amount of, we had like twice or three times as many chicks as we would have expected because of all the prey items that were available and all the eagles now having offspring. So it, there is variability on how often they are mating and reproducing. And does an eagle stay with one mate or does he mate around? There's, they're generally thought of as monogamous, yes. There have been some interesting cases that we try to pick apart, but it's it's, generally thought of that they're monogamous. Sometimes little differences, sometimes they choose. <laughs> yeah? Would you say that the uh, bald ego is as committed as the golden ego? As committed in it terms of monogamous? not timid. Um, so I remember talking to my colleague, because he also works on bald eagles. Um, maybe I think so, but Nah, I don't. I don't want to put words in people's mouth. I'm not really sure. Um, it's possible, but both both species, in terms of like interaction with each other, are highly territorial. So they're. I'm not really sure on their interactions with humans, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Would the parents attack if the chick was being threatened? For the golden eagles. Yeah. Um. I. I would think that they would see us as a threat, right? If we're in the nest. There's another predator. Oh. Not a human. Oh. Um. Yes. I don't think I've seen seen it in action. I would. I would think so. Yes. I think we're just a little more scary. We smell a little different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had that hand up. Yeah. So on that figure that you had about the radio collars. Yeah. Um. Couple questions. I wonder how many eagles were followed. It's not uh, clear. I mean, with all those lines crossing, there may have been five eagles or something like that. I'm exaggerating, but and it was there bias involved in terms of the ones that were tagged. How did how, how representative of that is uh, 
you know, golden eagles throughout that range, and how can you design an experiment where you can avoid bias and you're really looking at the picture. And as you said, there's not much going on in the Midwest. Um, and from a wildlife corridor standpoint, um, with all the farming that Adam's done in the Midwest, mm. it just changed historically. Um, so I'd have to pull up. I don't have a, a number in terms of telemetry, but like that was looked at, I think, between the 1960s and 2013 all the telemetry data that had been generated. There's been a bunch of telemetry reports and articles from Golden Eagles. Like one of my colleagues, Todd Katzner, there's a lot of telemetry work in Golden Eagles. Um, I should have a hard number for you. I don't, unfortunately, um, right now. And I think that, the, that many times when we, we capture these individuals, it's largely opportunistic. Like we, it's, it, you essentially can do, it's, it's hard to do like, any sort of transect work that you might do with other animals that might be like ground terrestrial animals, but it's, it's a little more difficult with golden eagles being timid and being a little more scarce and harder to capture that you have to kind of take what you can get. But in terms of like, in terms of relating, how are we understanding that, you know, maybe we're biasing these movements? If you can think about it, like we take this telemetry data and this genetic results that I just showed, they kind of um, mimic the same message that they might be like movements that's happening but the the idea of being that golden eagles might summer and winter certain areas they might be residential in areas and you can kind of you know blend this picture together with genetic data and telemetry data of like so we think they might reside some of the population might reside in Alaska we also see that in genetics so maybe that that hypothesis is true, like maybe that's what's happening. So this can kind of accompany what we're seeing with the telemetry data that genetics can. Does that answer my question? Well, maybe both studies are biased in the same way. It's that is, you only collect golden eagles in both studies for whatever reason, and that reason, uh, the differences, you know, is not, it's not apparent. Maybe they're harder to catch in those areas, or right. I, I have no idea, you know, what it would be. Yeah. I think I think a lot of times that the, the most we can say is that the, the sampling is opportunistic. It, they're incredibly hard to capture and to get permitting within states to do it also is challenging. So there's a lot of limitations that come not with the species biology itself, but also in like uh, government issued permits and things like that. And in Vermont, there's very few golden eagles, at least from what I see, to get counted. And is that a habitat that type of uh, issue? Is that we don't have a habitat that they? Uh... It uh, it could be there. I think in the eastern states, at least throughout literature, they've been known to be just migratory in within the the eastern states. But the idea historically that they were breeding within northern Canada, um, but there could you guys also have bald eagles as well, and if if there is some territory um, issues that might be happening. If a bald eagle, a bald eagle population has an established territory, a bunch of established territories, it's less likely that a golden eagle is going to come in and try to interrupt that territory. So there also could be establishment of not just bald eagles, but other prey um, raptors that might be disrupting that. But like I said, they prefer the western. The western population is very. The environment's very different, right? It's really hot out there, the temperature, and like also the vegetation and the, the scarceness. You guys have a lot of trees and things here. Um, I think they can utilize both spaces, but might have a preference towards those sparse places. I think Bill, sorry, I'm here. Oh, okay. I'll, yeah, I can answer yours. Oh, <coughs> so with the, uh, in the graph that you showed with the green next to the dark blue and light blue, yeah. Um, were those signifying like the tagged regions of, of specific genetic areas within, within the different uh, the colors? Species? Yeah. 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 Like, so those. What did those signify? Sorry, I didn't I catch the last part. What What did those colors signify? Like, I, I didn't. Like, yeah. Um. Those. I didn't get too much into it. So, those. Uh. Those colors that you're seeing. Essentially, what we're looking at is different markers within the genome. And when we were 
you basically make this, this mechanism to look at the DNA and to look at different areas within the genome. But when we, it's called an assay. So when we made this assay, we looked at um, area, we looked at certain markers within genes. So, you know, I was talking about beak formation. Well, that was one of the genes that we looked at was putting a marker in there and seeing if there's any genetic differences in the beak formation that might be happening between these golden eagles. And we did see some differences when we're comparing like Alaska to California in terms of how that specific marker and that gene is interacting or is exhibited between these populations. I don't have the graphs though, so I can't, they're, they're tied to different, to tie to different functions. So we can't, but it's, it's, we can say some things, but we can't be that confident because that's when, that's kind of like how whole genomes can come into play and to can really answer these questions because with genetics, it's just like, yeah, like one single thing, but whole genome data, like we can look at the entire gene itself. But if you want, this is a, this is a paper by um, Jacqueline Doyle. This is from 2016. If you look up Google and type in Golden Eagle SNP and you'll see her name from 2013, she goes into many different graphs of showing the differences between, between the genes. So she did, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, did you have a question? Well, just to follow on with that, can you, like, can you, so the, the birds are genetically different, the golden eagles are, can you tell that externally? I mean, can you look at the bird and say, well, that's a California, or that's an eastern? Not, not to my knowledge, okay. and I haven't, I haven't heard that from any of my colleagues who handle birds in different regions. I mean, they, they don't act differently, they don't have different appetites, or? They, they might be, um, the, the Alaskan birds, there, it's likely that the, Belas the Alaskan birds might be, I wouldn't say specializing, but preferring a certain diet there compared to California. California, they love small mammals, but they, there's a bunch of ground, there's ground squirrels in Alaska, but that's like, they, they love the ground squirrels. They might, you might see some differences in terms of what they're bringing in for prey, but I wouldn't necessarily say that they're specializing on certain ones, and I don't know if, um, I haven't heard of, uh, you know, morphological differences between the populations, but, yeah. but it's, yeah, so they, it's, it's interesting because you always think, shouldn't you see some physical differences? And it's like, maybe not to that level because it takes a lot to get to, it can take a, quite a bit of um, mitch, mitch, mismatching in genes to, to get to a physical product, sometimes it doesn't, but that further just drives that something below, you know, genetically might be happening that's interesting as well. When, um, when DDT was a big factor in, um, in uh, successful uh, nesting, yeah. um, over time that's diminished, but I wonder if there was any, ever any studies done about the genetic makeup of the birds and whether there was any um, selection for birds that had stronger shells or some other factor in addition to cutting out the use of DDT? Um, the DDT epidemic didn't affect the golden eagles nearly as badly as the bald eagles. The bald eagle population plummeted significantly, but that's mainly because bald eagles are mostly fishers, right? So golden eagles don't fish. They prefer terrestrial mammals or terrestrial organisms. So that large difference kind of that difference in diet kind of essentially saved them from having that, that they were affected a little bit, not to nearly the degree that bald eagles were affected at. Yeah, two questions before we take a break. First one is very quickly, I may have missed it. The 2013 uh, peregrine studies, where were they done? That was done in, um, in the UK, I believe. Okay. Uh, my other question is more of a personal nature, Nadia, yeah. <laughs> and it's <clears throat> directed to where do you see your own personal research interest going? Is it going to stay with raptors? And what particular questions are you interested in answering? Uh, <laughs> I think it's always the disappointing news that people love birds. They, I think they always, I love birds. I, well, mostly I love, I think you love the species that you get first introduced to, right? Like you just naturally open, 
open arms and hug them and love them forever. So I'll always love golden eagles. But, um, but I am moving on to fish for my PhD. So I'm going to be focusing on the species called the golden dorado. And they, their range is in South America. So I don't know if you've heard of them. If you Google them, golden dorado, there's this beautiful gold fish that's getting more and more popular in the recreation angling community. So people are paying a lot of money to travel from around the world to come to South America to catch this fish. Um, but unfortunately, we don't know a lot of biological traits of the fish. We don't know their, we're not confident in their migratory habits. And one big factor that is in South America is that there's an increase in the number of dams throughout. So they're essentially kind of creating these barriers um, to gene flow, or they might have what you call fish passages that can supposedly, you know, in theory, help the fish move across the dam, but that hasn't always been the case, that the fish aren't utilizing it like how humans might think. Um, so my interests, you know, because we don't know that much about the system, that's kind of where I'm coming in of looking at how the population is structuring in, in a similar fashion of, of how we did it here, you know, we're, we're taking a bunch of individuals and seeing what does it look like genetically? Are, are they large differences? Are they, or is there, you know, gene flow interacting or not? Um, so I'm going to be coming, coming at it with trying to understand what's going on with the river systems. It's a freshwater fish. It's supposed to be a freshwater fish. So I'm going to look at the population structure, but I, um, I also want to look at what's called a demographic history, so essentially looking at the history of the fish and understand was it always occupying these waters, was, you know, you can, was it always, um, if we do see it in, as two different, a couple different populations, you can look historically and be like, well before there, you know, maybe before there were dams, they all were one free-flowing population, or you could see the opposite, like they've always acted differently. Um, so it can be informative, so that's why I'm going to use both genetics and genomics to kind of tackle both conservation and evolutionary questions. I'm switching to fish. Yeah. Well, a chicken or egg comment, <laughs> and that is, I'm not sure if you <coughs> were attracted to <coughs> come to work with uh, Dr. Komorowski because of your interest in moving from the treetops to the stream beds, <laughs> or if it was the other way around, <clears throat> you're changing your interest because of her interest, which I'm, we're going to hear more about directly with <clears throat> Dr. Kumar. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Komorowski has already been introduced, so the floor is yours. So, um, thank you. Uh, to the Conservation Commission for the invitation. It's great to come up and meet everyone here. Um, I think Nadia did a great job introducing both raptors and some of the different techniques that we use. Um, and so I'm going to talk um, broadly about different types of tools that we can use. And I'm going to um, use sea turtles as kind of a lens through which we can study these things. But a lot of the questions that I'm going to talk about, you can think about, they, they're applicable in many different um, wildlife species that you have in your backyard. So um, I study a lot of aquatic and marine things, but the great thing about DNA is that everything's got it. And so a lot of the tools that we develop and use um, are being used by scientists all over the world uh, to study all sorts of different systems. So I call my lab the molecular ecology and conservation lab um, because we like to think that we're um, thinking more inclusively and broadly and that we try to use different molecular tools um, to get at questions to understand these amazing things that we see in nature and how the organisms that we're interested in are adapted and shaped by their environments. Um, and so how many of you guys uh, venture out to the coast sometimes in the summer? A couple hands? Okay. Okay, well maybe this will inspire you to get out there a little bit more, but also to think about how this might be used in the mountains and things that um, you guys love to, to see around here. So when I think about conservation biology, um, I think about all the different biological fields that give us information that help us understand the systems and that ultimately can help us conserve and manage them. And so, you know, all the way from ecosystem ecology or understanding energy flow um, down to physiological ecology and population genetics. <clears throat> 
And traditionally, um, Nadia introduced the kind of traditional genetic tools. We thought about, oh, my little animation didn't work. We thought about um, them using mostly in terms of uh, population genetics. But now when we have these genomic tools and molecular tools, we can actually use them in many different ways um, to both understand the population biology, but also a lot of different things um, across these other fields. So I'm just gonna touch on a few of those um, in my examples today. So the first question that many people have is what is molecular ecology research even look like? Um, and so the first component is that we're going out into the field and we're studying the organisms in their environment. And so um, for us, we study a lot of wet things. We go out in the rivers and oceans and we're sampling uh, animals, trying to get as much information as we can about them, often taking little tissue samples or the things as minimally invasively as possible. Um, we also bring animals back into the lab sometimes and see how they do under different environmental conditions. So for example, we're really interested in understanding how fish are going to cope with climate change. We might bring them into the lab and look at um, how they express their genes differently under different temperatures. Um, we take those samples into our molecular lab. Um, so that's me being a science nerd at the bench, pipetting all my DNA. Um, so that's, we process a lot of samples. And then as Nadia mentioned, we generate a lot of data that takes a lot of time um, for us to really make sure that we're interpreting the data um, as robustly as possible. Not only to be you know, robust in our science, but also because we know a lot of the stuff that we're doing has implications for the policy and the conservation. So we really want to make sure that we get it right. So what I want to talk about today are just a couple examples of how molecular tools help us learn things that we want to know about wildlife, but that we can't observe directly. Um, and so I've got examples of different organisms that myself and my colleagues have uh, worked on um, to understand um, you know, how their populations are divided or changing or affected by humans or um, their natural environment. So just as a quick refresher, so when I'm talking about these molecular tools, what I'm talking about is if we think back to your biology 101 class of understanding that our DNA holds all of the genetic code that makes us who we are or makes a sea turtle what it is. Um, but that actually how that plays out is by transcription into the RNA, so the messages that then gets translated into protein. So that's what actually does things. So when Nadia was talking about the beak shape, the code is in the DNA, but it's actually in the, the proteins and the expression of those genes that shapes that beak, that makes um, things what they are. So we can use tools at all these different levels um, to understand things that we wanna know. I'm gonna talk mostly today about DNA. I'm gonna touch on a couple examples of how we can also study RNA and proteins to learn things. Um, and just a quick thing, I'm not gonna talk about it today, but you've probably seen in the news, we're now um, appreciating that there are also epigenetic changes um, that can be really important. So modulations of the DNA that can make you um, different depending on your, the environment that you're in. So one thing I wanna point out is that when we're doing these genomic studies, the way that we get the most information out of them is by partnering with our collaborators who differ, do different types of studies. So um, Nadia mentioned earlier the telemetry. Um, that's really the telemetry, um, the health assessments, all of the information we can get from these animals. We wanna put that together into a bigger biological picture. So here I'm showing a picture of my work on leatherback sea turtles out on the Pacific coast. And so I don't know if you can see here, but this is us on a boat um, being shot from our aerial observer plane. Um, that's a little small of my colleague there on the plane, where they spot the turtle and they help us find it. Um, and then once we get it on board, we're trying to tag it, to put a little telemetry tag on it so we can see where it goes. We're taking blood for health assessment, um, and then we're taking a genetic sample. And then we're putting, we're trying to put all that information together to really understand what that animal's doing in the, its environment. So um, we're talking about genomics. Um, we're talking about all the different genetic information that's packed into an organism's chromosomes. And um, within those chromosomes, we have our, uh, we call it our genes and our intergenic regions. And I'm not gonna get into the details, but I just bring this up because when um, we were talking earlier about the different markers that we use, sometimes we wanna use markers that are in these, what we call neutral regions, where we're just kind of tracking how things drift um, through uh, isolation and other um, neutral processes. 
But sometimes we want to look actually at the genes themselves and look at functional differences. So I'm happy to talk more about that for anyone who's interested, but I just wanted to kind of highlight that and thinking about we study different regions depending on our biological questions. So when we think about sea turtles, they have a genome of uh, 2.2 gigabases, which is billion base pairs. So that's a lot of information to sift through. Um, and so when we think about how we want to study it, um, we have to be thoughtful about generating um, these big data sets and how we're going to effectively um, make sense of them. And really, we want to ask the question of how can we use these genomic tools to answer the important questions that we have in wildlife biology and conservation. So, like I said, we have a lot of information, but we can learn um, much of what we need from looking at subsections of that. So that's when Nadi was talking about the genetics versus the genomics. So if we have that whole genome, we can take different parts of it and use those targeted areas um, to tell us what we need. And so a couple of techniques that we use are called amplicon sequencing and sequence capture. And all this means is that we're targeting different regions of interest. Um, and what this has really changed in the last several years um, with technology is that instead of now looking at 10 markers, we can look at hundreds or thousands of markers and get um, fine scale resolution. But what's really cool, I think, for wildlife is that it's also given us this amazing flexibility to combine projects and markers and samples. So for some questions we have, we actually don't need thousands of markers. We just need a couple hundred that are really reliable and that we can look at over time, but maybe we have a lot of individuals we want to genotype. And so when we use traditional markers, we have to sit in the lab and do them one by one. And so many a grad student, including myself, has suffered <laughs> through that. Um, but now what we can do is actually put um, little um, barcodes on each strand of DNA. So here's a hypothetical tube, a tube of DNA from two different turtles. And this is their um, strands of DNA that come out of that. I can put a little tag that says, okay, this piece of DNA came from turtle one, and this piece of DNA came from turtle two. And I can mix those all together and sequence them. And then um, through data analysis, pull them back apart. So what this allows us to do is we call high throughput genotyping. So maybe now I have you know, many different animals that I want to learn about. I don't have to do them one by one. I can combine them all into one tube and then um, analyze the data uh, when, when it's all finished processing. So Nadia showed a structure plot earlier. Here's just a different version of that where, um, sorry, the words are a little small, but these are um, five different species of sea turtles, including some hybrids. So you notice how those bars are half and half. So they've got a mother from one species and a father from another. And so we put 1,500 samples together in a tube and then pulled them back apart and saw, could we separate them out effectively? And what you see with these very solid bars here is that, yes, we can do that. And they come, all their DNA separates back out and we can tell who's who. So this allows us to share data with our colleagues all over the world, which for many species is really important, like sea turtles um, that swim across the entire ocean sometimes. Um, and so we're trying to compare samples with our colleagues in Australia or Japan or other places. So what sort of situations would this be useful for? Um, there's lots of different things, but one of the things that um, is really important um, Nadia talked about, we're identifying different populations and how they're connected to each other. So we can use this um, to basically genotype the different groups and then separate out. Um, and for many species that are under threat, sometimes things show up um, through illegal trade. Uh, in the ocean, we have bycatch issues and we want to know which populations are being affected. So turtles that nest in one area, swim to a whole new region and get caught in a fishery, we want to know, okay, well, which, which turtle population is this fishery affecting? And it may be many different options. So we can use these genetic signatures to say, okay, most of the turtles are coming from the Costa Rica population. Um, and then we can target our conservation efforts. Um, another really cool application, so Nadi was talking about that genetic fingerprinting. So this is where we're using those genetic tags to actually identify individuals. Um, and so this is really useful when we want to understand information for population models. So when we're doing conservation, um, we think about population viability. So how likely is a population with the current trends to um, persist over a you know, certain number of years? And for that, we need information about their basic life history, which seems easy, but in a lot of these species, it's actually very hard to observe. 
So as an example, leatherback sea turtles nest um, on the beaches and they have you know, hundreds of thousands of hatchlings and they go out to sea um, and then we don't know when they come back. And there's key pieces of information like age and maturity that's really important for that model in order to be accurate but we have no idea. And so some people have estimated five years, some people have estimated 25 years, which as you can imagine, really changes our expectation for the population. So I've been part of this long-term study that my postdoc uh, advisor started in 2007. We thought, okay, well, if we take little biopsies from the hatchlings coming off the beach, so tiny pieces of their back flipper, and then we analyze the DNA and create genetic fingerprints for them, and then when the new females come back to the nest, we could look and see, we can actually match those fingerprints and see when she comes back. And so the idea is that we can match the, the hatchling with the nester and then know the time that it actually takes them to come back um, because they go out into the ocean for years, we don't see them, they show up and we can actually look at that fingerprint and say, ah, you came back when you were 10 years old to lay your first nest. So um, I can't share the results with you just yet because we're just reaching that 10 year mark, but this past year we had some pretty exciting preliminary results where we think we're getting close to that question. What I wanna point out with genomics is that um, when we're taking these samples, we start out with, you know, okay, we're gonna sample nests from across the different, um, the different nests across the beach, and then you do that year after year after year. There are now 30,000 hatchling samples in the freezer. So, we know we want grad students to work hard, but we think about having them do that individually, um, that is just insane, right? But now with these new technologies where we can process 2,000 samples at a time um, for a pretty cost and time effective, um, in a cost effective manner, it's actually a doable process. So that's kind of a, a different sort of application that we often don't think about with genomics um, that's proving to be pretty uh, cool and useful. Another thing we can do uh, is look at parentage. And so um, this is really useful. Another key part of understanding populations is sex ratios. So how many fathers and mothers are contributing to the population. But in many populations, it's hard to observe um, that, those patterns. So for sea turtles, for example, um, the mothers come ashore, but the, the male sea turtles, after they leave as hatchlings, they never do. Um, so how do we know how many males are contributing to the population? We can actually use genetics, where if you think about, um, so each of us as diploid organisms, we have two alleles for our genes, so we have one from our father and one from our mother. So we could actually play a game of matchup where we know the nesting mother's genotype, and then we can genotype the offspring, and we can basically put the pieces of the puzzle together to figure out what the fathers look like um, for their genotypes, and then we can count up how many unique genotypes we have and estimate how many fathers are in the population. Um, and this is really important for a lot of wildlife, but particularly, um, so sea turtles have temperature dependent sex termination. Um, so as the sand temperatures are warming with climate change, we're seeing more and more females. And we wanna understand and be able to track if this is actually changing the demographic ratios in the population. Um, and so we're using these techniques actually um, out in Hawaii uh, at the French Frigate Shoals nesting area to get an estimation of the demographic sex ratios. Um, so I mentioned earlier, we can do this uh, anthropogenic impacts to understand which populations are affected. So here's a leatherback um, sea turtle being caught in a fisheries net, and we genotype um, these individuals. We see that we have um, the blue is ones from the Western Pacific, and the gray are ones from the Eastern Pacific, and then the red dots are um, bycatch from Chile and Peru. So the default um, thought was that, well, all of the turtles that are being caught um, are, must be coming from um, Chile and Peru. But we actually see, um, or sorry, they're coming from the Eastern Pacific that are getting caught in Chile and Peru. Well, we actually um, find that some of them are actually coming from the Western Pacific. So that helps us to understand that if we want to understand these bycatch issues, we need to um, get together with our colleagues both in Indonesia, where the Western Pacific leatherbacks are coming from, um, and the Eastern Pacific um, in order to make an effective conservation plan. Okay, so then the last thing I think I have time to talk about today is whole genome sequencing. So um, Nadia kind of brought up some of the applications. And um, so I like to use the analogy of, um, you know, when we, 
talk about why we want whole genome sequencing. So I just showed you all the cool things we could do with just looking at parts of the genome. And I talked about how much information we get when we do whole genome sequencing and how that's pretty complicated to analyze and deal with. So the first question I think should always be in a biological study, well, why? Which, what is this going to get you that you can't get with the more simple um, genetic markers that you've been looking at? Um, so I'm just going to, maybe the wrong analogy for the crowd, but um, has anyone here watched the movie or the show Game of Thrones? Yes. Okay, a couple people. So if you have not, that's totally fine. Can anyone think of, of their favorite or a show or movie that they like that has a very complicated plot line? Anyone have an example? No? Okay. Or a book that you've read that has many different characters moving in from different areas? Any Middle other? March. What is it? Middle March. Middle March? Okay. I don't know that one, but it sounds wonderful. So if you think of Middle March or any other of your favorite books where you have to keep track of where everyone's coming from and how they're related to each other and the different plot lines, if you want to study just one set of characters from one particular area, so in Game of Thrones there's this town called Winterfell, and if you only care about what happens to the individuals there, you can just look in that one section and you'd be fine. Um, but when you start weaving the pieces together and you really want to understand the whole story, you need to take a step back and look at that entire map and understand where things are in proximity to each other and how when one thing happens in one area, it can affect things in another area. And that's really one of the powerful things about looking at whole genome maps um, in order to kind of put those pieces of the puzzle together. So um, when we think about what we want to use genomes for, we think about them like the book, right? It's the guide to what's in our DNA code. And this is what we want genomes to look like. Unfortunately, most genomes that we have now for wildlife look like this, um, where they're in hundreds and thousands of pieces, um, and that was using the best technology at the time. Um, but we need to improve our um, compilation of these genomes in order to really make sense of all the pieces together. Um, and so Nadia mentioned the um, falcon genomes that were created, and now how a new genome came out and how we learned so much more from that. So it's not to say that we can't learn things from those first genomes, but as we put the pieces together uh, in a more coherent way, we can learn more and more about them. So um, Tanya is going to talk about this a little bit, I think, in a few weeks, because she has been working on the Canada Lynx genome. Um, so I'm involved. We're just finishing up the leatherback sea turtle genome. And actually, this week, we found out that the funding is in place to finish our green, tur green turtle genome. What this means is that we will actually have um, those chromosomes I talked about in, um, all in place together. So we can not only look within species, we can compare across sea turtle species or with their sister taxa, for example, in birds, and understand those evolutionary relationships um, and a lot of different things about them that we can't understand right now. So for example, the green turtle genome that exists right now um, is in 300,000 pieces. Um, and the one that we'll be creating will be on that um, 56 diploid uh, chromosomal level. So that's really exciting for us. And so some of the things that we have uh, going on in the lab that we'll be using uh, these genomes for are to understand questions like how are populations of sea turtles uh, different today than what they were before uh, decline. So that demographic history that Nadia was talking about. So looking back through time, um, you know, way back before humans were on the scene, but also since um, humans came on the scene and we maybe have lost a lot of genetic diversity when they've gone through these um, bottlenecks. Um, we also uh, just started a project, it's really exciting, um, looking at genetics of migration in sea turtles. So I mentioned leatherbacks migrate across the entire Pacific Ocean, but some of them go different places at different times, and we really don't know um, why and how they do this. And so by having genomes of sea turtles that have this migration and also homing behavior, so they swim back to their beach where they were born or in a region where they were born. Um, how do they do that? Why do they do that? And now that we have genomes from both sea turtles as well as tortoises that don't have those behaviors, we can start to answer those questions. That's really exciting. Um, and we can also start to look at inter and intra species comparisons. So there are certain species that um, are much more at risk for disease. So there's a tumor disease that green turtles get that other species don't seem to get as much and we don't know why. So we can study their immunome, so all of the immune genes that they have and try to understand why they might be susceptible to disease. 
And then really, the goal of these projects, um, as we kind of talked about the different applications in birds and turtles and, and other species, is that once we have these maps, everyone's research will be easier. We'll be able to learn so much more about these animals, um, as well as if we circle back to that amplicon sequencing, kind of when you want to target things, that will be easier as well, because instead of having to find those regions, you can just go look at the map, pick what you want, and move forward. So it's a pretty exciting time to be involved in this research. So um, it's 11.30, so I have one more thing, but I think I'll probably just stop here, because um, I think we're, that's where we're wrapping up. Is that <coughs> correct? Well, we still have 20, 25 minutes. Oh, okay. You guys want to hear one more thing? Okay. <laughs> so um, I lied. There's, there's two more things that are short. So what I've been talking about so far has all been focusing on the DNA, and I just want to quickly highlight a couple of applications that we can learn from the RNA and the, um, the proteins. So um, we also think about environmental stress in my lab a lot, so things that are in the environment both naturally and um, because of humans, where environmental conditions change and the organisms need to adapt their homeostasis in order to, um, to survive and to thrive. And sometimes they can do that and we want to understand how, and sometimes um, it's hard for them to do that and they are stressed out. Um, and so we have things like temperature, salinity, oxygen, um, contaminants and disease that are all affecting our organisms and we want to um, understand these patterns, particularly under global change where we're seeing rapid changes in many of these conditions and we want to understand if they're negatively impacting our organisms. So as our streams warm, um, you know, how are the fish going to be able to, to cope with that? And often we think about environmental stress, we think about kind of dramatic scenes like fish, fish kills. Um, which can happen when the oxygen levels drop really quickly, and so you get a lot of um, fish that can't cope and they all go belly up. Um, but often, actually, what's happening in nature is what I like to call uh, the fish in a vice situation, where we're not seeing this, where we can directly observe uh, mortality, but they're being stressed out and they're being um, affected in ways that will ultimately affect their population, their ability to reproduce and to thrive um, in our ecosystems. So we want to use tools um, from genomics and we call transcriptomics to be able to assess when they're stressed out. Um, and so I've studied this a lot for my dissertation and for work since then, where we can take um, fish that we are concerned about. So this is the endangered delta smelt uh, in the San Francisco estuary system that I studied for my PhD. Um, as well as other fish um, my collaborators have worked on, like salmon, we can actually take um, non-lethal gill samples and learn about how things change over time for them. And in a nutshell, the different ways that we can um, do this is we look and see um, which genes are being turned on and turned off under different environmental conditions. So what I'm showing you here is called a heat map, where um, essentially um, all the genes up here that are showing in red are turned on, so they're expressed in really high levels, and those genes have to do with their stress response. At the same time that this happens, these genes down here that are in blue are down-regulated, so they're turned down. So what this is basically telling us is that under these higher temperatures that we expose the fish to, that they're exhibiting this stress response, they're dealing with the emergency, but they're doing that at the cost of their normal biological functions. So this makes sense, right? If there's a fire in your kitchen, you're going to stop folding the laundry and doing your normal tasks in order to deal with this emergency situation. And this is a conserved response across many different organisms. Um, but if these stressful conditions continue, eventually you have to do the laundry, right? So you need to, um, we need to think about how in the long term this is affecting um, the population. So maybe they're dealing with the stress, but as a result, they will have lower reproductive output. So finally, um, my last example, if we jump over here to our proteins, um, is thinking about uh, when I mentioned earlier that temp um, sea turtles have temperature-dependent sex determination, and we want to know how many males and females there are in the population, um, but we can't tell that externally until they get to adults. Um, so this is a mature male with this um, long tail and a mature female. But now if I put this picture up, can anyone tell me who is the male and who is the female? We can't tell, right? So what we need to do is use our molecular tool bag um, to tell us which one is male and which one is female. And so what we can do is actually take blood samples. Um, now instead of looking at the DNA, because they don't have sex chromosomes, um, we can actually look at the plasma. 
Um, so many of us have gone to the doctor, get your blood draw. I always find it ironic because I've suck so many turtles now whenever they miss the vein I figure I deserve it um, and so we spin down the blood and we take this plasma and we quantify how much protein there is um, for testosterone and so young turtles even though they're not exhibiting that long tail yet they do have significantly higher levels of testosterone so higher than 300 picograms per milliliter um, and females are lower than 100 and so through that we can actually look at the immature turtles and figure out how many males and how many females we have. And so through this, um, this is my colleague, Dr. Cameron Allen, who's led a lot of this research. He's a wildlife endocrinologist. Um, where we're seeing through these hormone assays um, that more and more populations are showing up with strong female bias. Um, we saw strong female bias in some populations historically, but now we're starting to see more of that. And so um, there's thoughts about that, how that's changing with warming sea temperatures and how we're going to monitor that throughout time. So, um, so that's just one example of how we can learn from things all the way from DNA, RNA to proteins um, to get at things with little samples that we take without harming the individuals um, that, of the populations that we're trying to, to learn from. Yeah? And why do you think that is? Why do I think? Why what? That, that, there's a, that there's this changing to a strong female bias. So um, the sand temperatures, so the way that turtles nest is they lay, lay, their, sand, lay their eggs in the sand and bury them. Um, and there's pivotal temperatures above which females are produced and below which, sorry, I should have clarified that. So it's different in different reptiles. So some of them have the reverse, um, but in sea turtles, it's higher temperatures produce females. Um, and so we're still learning. We don't just wanna jump the gun and say, um, you know, oh, the turtles are going to die because they also have been around for millions of years. And so they may have other things um, in their genomic trick bag that um, could cope with their, um, this change to their environment. Um, they could also change the timing of their nests or the locations that they're picking to pick cooler temperatures. Um, but the, the proximate reason is that as you put the nest or have the nest in warmer sand temperatures, you're producing more and more females. Yeah, sorry, I should have clarified that. So hopefully I've convinced you that we can learn a lot from little samples um, to really help us understand these populations and species that we're interested in conserving and restoring. Um, and that as we move forward, um, we can think about how to apply these to all the different types of wildlife um, that we're interested in, um, in the oceans for me, but in your backyard, um, I guarantee there's a lot of scientists around here um, that are using similar tools and thinking about these questions um, to get at these conservation wins. So I have a lot of people that I work with that I always like to acknowledge um, that are fabulous in making my research and lab um, go. And thank you all again for having us. It's been super fun, and I'll take questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yep. Uh, I, I know the question of homing and sea turtles have been around a long time. Mm -hmm. I you know, remember reading Windward Road, Archie mm -hmm. Carter, and he was collecting anecdotes about uh, how turtles on mm -hmm. are you getting anywhere near figuring that out? Yeah, so there's been some really cool research in the past decade really, but um, actually I came from the International Sea Turtle Symposium conference last week um, where it was hosted by uh, Ken and um, Kathy Lohman who really spearheaded this research from a sensory biology perspective. So they're looking at that, you know, how do they do it? Um, and there seems to be pretty strong evidence that in part they're, um, they're imprinting on magnetic fields. Um, and that's one way that they can um, basically go out into the ocean and then find their way back home. Um, what I was talking about them with is that, um, you know, do we know that this is imprinting and that it's something that when they hatch out, um, that wherever we put them, they can imprint on a new genetic or um, magnetic field. And this has really important implications as we think about relocation programs. Um, or is it something that's innate, that's inherited? Um, and it's something that we haven't been able to look at before, and that's one of the studies that we're starting in my lab. 
where um, we have samples from um, a national collection where we actually know their um, migration history, so through telemetry um, and also a stable isotope analysis where we can look at the signature of like where they've been, what they've been eating in the different regions of the ocean. And we can basically assign them and say, okay, you are a, a South China Sea forager, you're a California forager, and then we can take those samples um, look at their genetics and see if there's different genes that are actually being inherited. So um, that's the first thing, the reason I was working on this, the leatherback genome was that until we have that map, it's really hard for me to look for those genes. So we're just finishing up the map and we got a new grant to analyze the um, telemetry samples. So we're hoping to kind of put that extra layer on. So that's what we're we'll working on probably for the next five years or so. <laughs> Um, but the magnetic field, as far as following um, the fields of the Earth, shows that that's um, at least one of the ways that they're able to go so far away and then come back. Yeah, so we learned a lot. Yep. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about the uh, bio repositories that may exist. You talk about taking small samples. You have a small sample that can only be divided up so many times and shared with so many people. Well, you could say, well, when you analyze it once, that's what you need, just your analysis. There's nothing where anyone's going to think of down the road that would be productive. So how do these biorepositories work? How do you uh, interact with people throughout the world? Um, so yes, those are excellent points, and, uh, and they're ongoing discussions. Um, I think that it's very easy to think at the time that when you collect your samples that you're going to do the analysis and no one's ever going to want to do anything after. Um, luckily, I have, uh, and I think in, in other wildlife species there's similar folks that, you know, 20, 30 years ago they had the foresight to kind of think, well, we don't know what the technology is going to, the future is going to bring, but we should probably save some tissue um, and some DNA. And so, um, for example, a lot of the um, samples that I showed with the 1,500 animals altogether. That came from a national collection at the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center archive that has had people, collaborators, contributing for the last 30 years from all over the world. And they're small pieces of tissue, um, but they actually can go a long way. So what we try to do every time we take a little piece of that is to take as small a piece of, as possible and to also extract as much as we can out of it. So. Um, for many of those samples, there's still little pieces of <coughs> tissue in the freezer, but there's also DNA in the freezer. And when I take my alloc my little subset out, I leave the rest there. And you're right in that it's it's not something that can last forever, but we try very hard to use only the minimal amount that we have to for the study because we don't know what's gonna come. Um, you know, even a couple years ago when I was doing um, a reduced representation analysis, I thought, okay. You know, this is going to be it because we're going to we're going to analyze everything we want to from these samples, and then within a year, I was like, oh wait, I want to do whole genome sequencing on it now, or you know, in a couple of years from now, we want to do epigenetic signatures and understand how the imprinting is changing their um, methylation signatures or epigenetic things. So I think we have the technology as it's changed. One thing that's been good for everyone to see is exactly that that we don't know what's coming, and so if we can build these repositories and um, try to make the samples last as long as possible, um, that that'll really help in the long run. But it's not a perfect system for sure, and we rely on you know, museums and freezers that hopefully will never go down, and um, you know, it's definitely not perfect, but everyone involved is, is thinking about that long-term uh, plan, I guess. The freezers are expensive, the electricity to run them. Can you lyophilize these uh, samples and uh, get the uh, cheaper, better ways of, of doing this? Um, there are some repositories that, that, that are doing that. Um, I think it depends on what you want to do. So our, some of our samples um, in collections that I've used are, um, are freeze-dried and other things, um, but some of that actually damages the DNA where you can't, you can only use certain analyses with that. Um, so yes, the freezers and electricity are expensive. People are trying to think about other ways, but we don't have a perfect solution. Other questions? Questioned out with the raptors. <laughs> yeah, Bill. Well, you mentioned the damage to DNA 
from conventional freezers. Is mm -hmm. that also true in liquid nitrogen preservation? Um, so liquid nitrogen uh, does a better job if it's, you know, if you, so you take a sample and you're dropping it into a very cold temperature very quickly. And so we, we know that that can prevent damage. Um, the biggest thing is the freeze thaw. That, so this is, of course, an issue if you're taking little pieces for different studies and every time you have to freeze thaw them. Um, that's when a lot of the, the damage can occur. So liquid nitrogen is an option to avoid that, but at some point, if you want to use that, you have to get it out, um, and so damage can occur then. But you can still use it for a lot of things, um, just not some of the more um, whole genome sequencing approaches. Yeah. Uh, this goes back to the beginning when you talked about a tag. Could you describe what does that mean, a tag, in this context? So um, when I was talking about, uh, see me in the slide, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so there's two kinds of tags that I was talking about. So um, when we first were calling the genetic tag, which is referring to the fingerprint, it's just meaning that if I take a piece of skin um, or you know, saliva from you, that I'm going to be able to tell who you are. So that's your genetic tag or your genetic fingerprint. Um, but then what I was talking about here is that we can add Basically, there's short little, we call them barcodes. So if you think about the supermarket, it's the same idea where it's just this short sequence of nucleotides that we know what it is. And so I have a spreadsheet and I say, you know, I have my ATG, uh, ATGC, um, and that tag, that little oligo, um, I put on all of the DNA for turtle number 527. And so um, it's just a, a simple process where um, we, call, we call it ligating, where we're just sticking it on to the ends of the DNA. And so um, what that means is that each of the pieces of DNA from that turtle now have that little sequence at the end. And so then when I sequence them, I know that all of those that have that sequence came from that turtle. Does that make sense? Yeah. Blows my mind, but yeah. <laughs> right. Me too, me too. <laughs> so you're, you're actually physically taking that barcode like thing, that sequence, and. Like gluing it on the end. Even though the, what, even though the, the gene that you're gluing it to is not separated, is this is like happening in solution or something? Yeah, so, so let's say I have a tube of DNA from my turtle. The first thing I'm going to do, um, depending on the protocol, is I'll, I'll do something to basically chop it up into shorter fragments. And so I might do that with a restriction enzyme, or I might do that just by, we call it sonicating, is just like basically creating sound waves and breaking it up. So now instead of having my long chromosomes, I have in like little pieces. And then I put the tags in the tube and run it through um, a thermal cycler, basically heating it up to um, with some enzymes in the tube, um, does magic, as Nadia likes to say, and basically just sticks that tag on the end of all the DNA fragments in the tube. Then once I'm done with that, I can combine all the tubes together. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Yes? So I'm just curious, uh, I imagine you're also teaching because you're at a, at a mm -hmm. university. So what percentage of your professional time do you spend in the field, in the lab and teaching? Um, that's an excellent question. I feel like the answer is like 80, 80, 80. <laughs> um, but um, I, I'm just in my finishing my first year. And so um, a lot of what we've been doing is um, building new projects in New England. So I mostly talked about um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I was doing on the West Coast. And what I'm really excited about is a lot of new projects we have um, with partners here um, to um, you know, kind of apply these techniques to things like river herring um, and um, working with Tanya on her links projects and other things. But right now, that's a lot of building up. So I haven't been in the field this past year. You can probably tell by how pale my face is. Um, and I've also been developing my, my courses. Um, but over time, also as the graduate students to get their projects going, um, we hope to be more balanced. So we have a marine lab out in Gloucester. Um, so. We're still building it up, but hopefully in a couple of years, if anyone comes out, we'll be up and running. Um, where we're out there doing a lot of the hands-on research in the spring and summer, um, and then we teach during the year. Um, so that's a long way of saying 
it's a busy time right now, but hopefully it kind of evens out. Um, and then of course, a big part of what we do as well is um, you know, service to the, the community and different uh, levels, like coming to talk to you guys here, which we always love to do. Yeah. Thank you so very much for coming here. Thank you for having us. It's been really fun. Yeah. Quick question. The gentleman was talking about tag and everything. Are, are you taking the different tags to try to make the turtle stronger against disease or anything like that? Uh, we are not doing anything like that, but there are people uh, thinking about this. So um, has anyone heard of CRISPR in the news, 60 Minutes? Okay, so that's um, gene editing. Uh, that is now uh, a very real possibility for a lot of different applications. Um, where we are is that we still have so much to learn about the genome and what's going on that we are not in a position to mess with it. Um, that's kind of where I, believe. yeah, I mean, but even, I just think we have a lot more to learn. In more model systems, um, I think that it does have some really interesting applications. So one of the, um, not necessarily CRISPR, but one of the ways that um, people are using this is um, by building or trying to breed heat resistant corals. So on coral reefs where we're seeing these higher sea temperatures and so we have these mass bleaching events and coral die-offs, that's a really important um, ecosystem kind of habitat for many of the fish, so it's, it's a big deal. Um, there's these groups uh, out in Hawaii and other places that are working on actually breeding the, some corals, they have gene genetic variation, picking the corals that seem to do better and then trying to um, you know, build them up and outplant more and more of them to have these heat resistant coral reefs so that we can have coral reefs into the future. Um, there may be some people that are doing some gene editing with that. I'm, I've heard a little bit, I'm not sure, um, because they do know, I think, some more of the, um, the kind of temperature related genes. Um, but I think we still have a lot to learn before we start changing anything, that's my opinion. Um, did you follow up and then? Yeah, so I guess the sad thing about that is it takes so long for you to see the finished product. Yes. <laughs> it does take a long time, but I would also say that there's many things we can be doing in the meantime as we learn. So one of the things that we always try to give our information back to the um, management policymakers is to help them understand the effects that are going on and then to build resiliency, right? So with the, the bycatch, um, that there are different quotas or not quotas, uh, I guess limits to say how many bycaught animals can be in a fishery before it gets shut down. Um, and that's related to knowing where the animals are coming from, where they're going to. So we can, um, we try very hard to transmit that information as, as early as possible, um, but not you know, in a way that we clearly communicate where we're not sure. Um, and of course, that works its way through the system sometimes more slowly than we want it to. Um, but I think there are ways that we can, um, even before we have the final answer, um, communicate our results in ways that are helpful. Thanks. Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, so in the example you were just giving of the coral where you try to select out mm -hmm. those coral that are going to do better. Our mother does that too. Okay. It seems to be Mother Nature. So oh, yeah. how much better uh, is this approach going to be than, than what, uh, what nature's doing? Um, well, I think my, my first answer is time will tell. Um, I think part of the reason that we're thinking about this kind of human-assisted evolution um, idea is that the rates that things are changing are much faster um, and that we, we're basically thinking about how we can help selection along. Um, so in, in these cases, it's whether or not it will happen naturally, we're seeing some cases of rapid evolution where species are adapting. Um, but particularly in the case where some of these systems are already stressed out from other things, so they don't have a lot of resiliency per se. Um, so Mother Nature, right, does this where um, you have selection on a population, but how that plays out relies on what genetic variation is there to begin with. And if there's a lot of organisms that are stressed out from other things like overfishing, uh, you, you know, eutrophication, other types of pollution, um, that the idea is that through this uh, added help um, that it can build resiliency. But time will tell. <laughs>
Oh, we just have a couple of minutes. I, I was, but just in closing, I was glad that you mentioned stayed on with the stress uh, <clears throat> application because uh, on uh, our lecture on March 8th uh, will be exactly that, uh, climate stress, environmental stress on the red spruce populations in uh, uh, our Green Mountains. Uh, and thanks so much, Lisa, not only for coming yourself, but putting us in contact with other UMass people, which we depended on you to do at the beginning yeah. of the time. So, 